We welcome Patty Lowe, who is going to talk about Native American environmental stewardship. Patty is a PhD professor in the UW-Madison Department of Life Sciences Communication, documentary producer, and former broadcast journalist in public and commercial television. As a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Ojibwa, she is the award-winning author of three books and has produced many documentaries for public and commercial television, including the award-winning Way of the Warrior, which aired nationally on PBS in 2011 and 2007. Her outreach work focuses on Native American youth and digital storytelling. We look forward to Patty's presentation. And Patty, we've made a contribution to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund as a way to say thanks uh, for speaking to us today. The University Bookstore also will be selling copies of Patty Lowe's book, Seventh Generation Earth Ethics, in the hallway after today's meeting. The cost is $23 and she will uh, be available to sign your copy if you wish. Our thanks go to Pat McGowan and University Bookstore, which will donate the proceeds of today's book sales to the Madison Rotary Foundation. And as we welcome her to the podium, I want to remind you that if time allows and you have a question for the speaker, please use one of the microphones that uh, will be uh, passed around. We are videotaping today. In order to uh, get your question on the videotape, we will want uh, on the video recording. Uh, it's uh, important to wait for the microphone. Please join me in welcoming Patty Lowe. Clicker. Well, my husband was wrong. He said, oh, nobody's going to show up today because this is the first opening televised day of the Cactus League spring baseball season. <laughs> but here you all are. I guess some of you forgot to put that on your calendar, right? <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me. And I, um, I'm always uncomfortable promoting my, my books. But I did want to mention to you that the book is, that's being sold today, 100% um, of the royalties go to the Wisconsin Indian Education Association for scholarships. So you can feel really good. You can get the book out of the library if you want. But this, if you're going to buy any of my books, this would be a good book to buy. So I wanted to talk to you about seventh generation land ethics. And it follows my book, Seventh Generation Earth Ethics, which is a collection of biographies of Native American environmental leaders. But um, with apologies to my editor, who is in the house, um, I will say the book talks can be kind of ponderous at times. And so I thought I would spare you that and, um, and talk about some of the themes that have come out of the, those books, um, some of the biographies. Uh, and the biogra biogra biographies, I will say, um, include people like Sparky Wachaw from Menominee, uh, Joe Rose from Bad River, and Walter Brissett, who is one of the co-founders of the Wisconsin Green Party. And each of them, sh you know, the 12 Indian nations in Wisconsin are, are quite diverse. Um, and you may not know, there are actually 566 federally recognized tribes in the United States. They all have unique histories, cultures, languages. Um, but there, there does seem to be a unifying theme uh, that has to do with land stewardship. And I'm not overstating it to say that most of the Native communities that I am familiar with have this spiritual connection to the land, the plants, and the animals. There's this sense that human beings are interdependent, not just with other human beings in their community, but also with plants and animals, some of whom are identified as relatives. There's a sense that there's an obligation to the land. And again and again, when I visit Native communities, I'm hearing people say, we live so close to our landscape we see the changes first. We see what's going on there. And so trust us when we tell you we're seeing these things and we can be the first ones to help respond to those challenges. And then this theme, which is what I want to talk most about today, which is that certain places are sacred and should be accommodated. And this is a really interesting question when you think about you know, what makes a place sacred. 
uh, we have an, ide an idea of what places are sacred. Um, if you belong to one of the dominant religions, if you're Christian or a Jew or you practice Islam, um, there are identifiable holy places. When I see a minaret or a temple or a church spire, I know that that place is holy to more than one person because a community of people built that structure. And so I respect that and understand that this is a holy place and I accommodate that sacredness. The major religions have portable holy items. Um, you can take a rosary and put it in your pocket. You can have a prayer rug and put it over your shoulder. You can wear a Star of David. And you can go anywhere on the planet and practice your faith and probably find some people who are willing to, to uh, worship with you. And when people come together in a spirit of, of worship and community, they pray for people, they pray for things, they pray for blessings, they pray for peace, um, but they're praying for people or things. Now here's where things start to break down and where I see this disconnect. Because when practitioners of nature-based religions worship. It's done so in places that aren't identifiably sacred to other people. Um, if you go to Bad River and, and spend some time in our wild rice ancient beds, you won't see any stained glass or any spires or anything to identify it as a sacred place. And so people don't so mainstream people don't understand that it's sacred, and it's difficult to accommodate something sacred if you don't know that it's a holy place. Our holy places are not portable. If you're an Ojibwe, wild rice is sacred. Um, to the Menominee, wild rice is sacred. To the Oneida, a standing stone is, is sacred. If you go to any native community, you will find this sac sacred place and everything worth remembering and, and an entire society is organized around that place. And I, it took me many years to understand this because I was writing histories. I'm kind of squeaking, aren't I? Can you still hear me if I step back a little? Is that better? Okay. Um, it took me many years to, to understand that native people don't think about history in terms of a linear uh, period. You know, when I went to school, uh, I was trained in a Western historical tradition where you start with something, that's your beginning, and you end with something, and you plug in names and dates and facts and historical events along a timeline, and that's history. What I came to understand as I spent time in Indian country is that Native people don't conceive of history as a linear concept. It's a place, and everything worth remembering, and all the ceremonies and everything that's taught, and the politics and the law emanate from that space, that radiate in a circle. That's really something that's difficult to get your head around, and it's I still kind of have to remind myself, you know, you need to think like a Native person if you're going to write Native history. Um, but our, so our holy places are not portable. And here's the thing, and, and this is really a difficult concept for people that uh, are not part of this, these nature-based religions to understand. We don't, we don't pray for ourselves, for people, for things, for blessings, we pray for that place. That's what we're praying for, the water. We, we're praying for the rice. We're play, praying for that sacred space. And wherever you go in Indian country, the people that um, are indigenous to that place have that sacred spot. That's a really different, you know, it's a very difficult concept. And so while it broke my heart, I understand how somebody from the Wisconsin legislature can come up to our reservation and look at our, our rice and say, you know, 
I don't know what the big deal is. You know, it's just a bunch of weeds. So I want to tell you about our rice. And, um, and thank heavens there's snow on the ground because we can only tell certain stories when it's wintertime and there's snow. A long time ago, um, the Ojibwe people were first in the Great Lakes region. There was a flood. There, now th I'm giving you the Reader's Digest version of this story, which takes about four days to tell. But there's a couple of worlds. But in the world I'm talking about now, there's been a flood. And the Ojibwe have moved to the East Coast, where we've been living now for such a long time that we've forgotten where our original homes are. And there's, there's a crisis. And a woman has a dream. And in this dream, this prophecy is revealed that, that something bad is going to happen. And unless the Ojibwe people go back to their original homes, we're going to be destroyed. And um, and what I think uh, what I think the crisis is is uh, contact between the Norse colonists about the year 1000 in Vinland and Marksland and some of the other colonies in um, present day Newfoundland, which were introduced. And th these are these these uh, hand to hand um, contacts are described in three. Uh, Icelandic sagas. So, I mean, we know that this happened. We know that there's contact, there's trade, there's some other un more unpleasant things, but people are touching. And uh, I think that's when the European diseases are introduced into North America, what, you know, North America, and are introduced through the Indian trade routes. Because um, now that same um, century, at least the way I'm trying to reconstruct it. Um, part of the prophecy was that a mega shell would appear in the sky and the people needed to follow the mega shell. It would lead us back through seven stopping places and it would lead us back to our original homelands where the food grows on water. So I think the mega shell was actually the, um, uh, the supernova, the crab nebula exploding in the year 1054 which would line up with some of what was going on, the crisis, got to, you know, have to leave. And these seven stopping places included places, uh, a place of thundering water, um, Niagara Falls, a place, uh, a turtle-shaped island. Actually, there are two turtle-shaped islands, a place of great medicine, a place where a river cut through the landscape like a knife, the Detroit River, um, a, a place of shallow water where there were so many fish you could almost walk across their backs, Sault Ste. Marie, and then um, some other markers that brought the people to present-day Duluth and back to explore the south shore of Lake Superior where we found the wild rice, the food that grows on water. And if you look at our history, now the Dakota had moved in and there were these tremendous battles over this incredible resource because wild rice lasts forever. It's a superfood, um, high in protein. I mean, this was a food that got people who were on a starvation and feast cycle through the winters. So there were battles over it. In our treaties, if you look at the treaties that we were forced to sign, and you say, you know, the government's going to give us six cents an acre and we're going to and they're going to give us some blacksmith shops. And we in our um, in our articles insisted. And this is the language that you see in all the treaties, the right to hunt, fish and gather rice upon the waters in the land that we were giving up. So um, and some of you may remember some of the violence that happened as people were trying to exercise their treaty rights in the 1980s and 90s. I mean, everything, and, and our ceremonies, our, we, our, our powwow is called the Monoman Wild Rice Powwow every August. Everything in our community is focused around wild rice, the food that grows on water. So when the Gogebek Taconite Mine uh, Company announced that it wanted to build what eventually would be a 22 mile long open pit taconite mine. And we know um, that what happens when air and water 
meets sulfide, and the magnetite was uh, was stacked between two layers of rock that contained pyrite. We knew that that was going to create sulfuric acid. Um, and it was going to flow downstream from the upland where this mine was, flow down um, through our Bad River into our wild rice beds uh, in Lake Superior. And so, you know, uh, elders that I knew to be the kindest, gentlest elders you could possibly imagine were telling me that that mine was going to go in over their dead body, and they were serious. I mean, they were talking about lying down in front of those mining uh, machines if, if it came to that. So this was, I mean, th this produced such tremendous anxiety in our community. And when I talk about the seventh generation philosophy, and this is kind of a prelude to a short little minute and a half clip of a documentary that some of the, the kids that I work with at Bad River had produced. Um, the seventh generation philosophy refers to this long range vision that tells us whenever we make an important decision, we are obligated to think about how that decision will, will affect generations seven into the future. So we're thinking 240 years in the future. And the people that signed these treaties, one of which was my great, 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 three greats, four greats, Chief Lundsvat, Mangasat, um, was one of the, he signed two of the three session treaties. And when our ancestors sat down and were forced to give up this land, they knew that it was not going to be enough to sustain the people, that that, you know, those 70,000 acre reservations or 120,000 acres was not going to support a society that hunted, fished, and gathered for their existence. And so they insisted that we would have this right to go outside of our original reservations in this larger land that we were giving up and hunt and fish and gather. They weren't thinking about themselves. They were thinking about my generation, um, these generations in the future. And so um, I want to uh, play a short little excerpt from uh, a documentary that three 14-year-olds produced. They shot every frame of video. They composed the original music that you're going to hear. And they interviewed elders. They, they, they felt that the state had never heard from the Bad River people who were in the, in the mine sites of this uh, taconite mine and felt that, that the mainstream culture really didn't understand what our objections were. And so these kids did this documentary to try to um, help educate people. In the way that our ancestors thought was to look at the bigger picture of everything but not only what was directly in front of us and around us, but what was far into the future. And part of that is looking at the seventh generation ahead. And every generation does that. My generation will do that. Your generation will do that. Uh, the past generations have done that for me. I don't uh, approve of any degradation to our mother, the earth. Nimama Kinan is the word. And Nimama Kinan takes care of us. And we know from the beginning of time that as long as we took care of her, she would take care of us. And today, society is changing so much that they're forgetting that where everything comes from and that they're they're looking at something totally different from what the earth provides and not seeing that in the destroying the earth so significantly we are destroying the people 
So uh, this was, uh, to put it in perspective, this was the first phase of the mine, uh, four and a half miles. And if it were superimposed over downtown Madison, this is how big that mine would have been, just the first phase. 22 miles is if, if you uh, started here um, on the end of the park and went to the bridge at Sauk City, that's 22 miles. That's how long this mine would have been. So um, we're not the only uh, Indian nation that is facing environmental challenges. Um, as I mentioned, Wisconsin, there are 12 Indian nations uh, here in the state, 11 of them federally recognized, and uh, that's more Indian nations east of the Mississippi River than any other, and that, that's more Indian nations um, than any other state east of the Mississippi River. So um, I have some, uh, some Ho-Chunk, uh, colleagues in the audience, and um, you know, I I want to tell you uh, that they're very concerned about frac sand mining. You may know that Wisconsin's um, sand is highly prized for hydraulic fracturing, and um, and the it's the the fineness of the sand that is creating concern for people. I think it was ten years ago, or um, in 2010, there were 21 mines. There are 158 frac sand mines today. And many of them are circling um, sacred places for the Ho-Chunk. Uh, people are very concerned about silicosis and breathing in the fineness of that sand. They're concerned about, about water and the loss of their sacred springs. And um, so this is, you know, this is an issue that uh, I hope you would pay attention to, because the um, it's causing tremendous anxiety in the the Ho Chunk Nation. Um, the other issue, and this is you know the this was not one of the bills that was voted on, but it remains on the front burner for a lot of Ho Chunk people who are very concerned about um, this proposed legislation that would allow property owners to excavate effigy mounds to determine whether they contain human remains. You know, imagine. If someone told you that they were going to dig up your family plot to, you know, see whether your grandmother or your, you know, your uncle was in fact buried in the plot that, you know, the Ho Chunk have have told us where which of the mounds contain human remains and which don't, um, and they've told us that these effigy mounds contain human remains. We have no reason not to to believe them. And uh, to understand, as, and I think everybody in this room would agree that um, burial sites are sacred, sacred land. They're hallowed ground for anyone, whether you're native or non-native. Uh, the Red Cliff Ojibwe, here's another um, environmental issue to watch. Um, the Red Cliff and Bad River Bands are very concerned about a proposed uh, 26,000 pig operation, um, what we call a concentrated animal feed operation, a CAFO. Um, this is going to generate uh, billions of gallons of manure, uh, create perhaps groundwater pollution. We all read the paper probably, and you heard about the uh, manure accident that happened that created a massive fish kill uh, in our area. Um, so people are very concerned about that. The um, farm is, is uh, only a third of a mile from Fish Creek and um, upland from Lake Superior. So any kind of spills would head downstream. And for us, Lake Superior is, is a place of great medicine. It's, it's a very important resource for all of us. So with that, um, I will thank you. And if you have any questions, thank you so much for letting me share this. Uh, minutes with you. Hi, Patty. Thanks for coming. And my question has to do with restoring sacred land after it has been defiled. One of the things we found out about the armed insurrectionists uh, who took over the federal refuge is that they intentionally defiled a Native American sacred sites. Now, if a temple is defiled, it can be reconsecrated. Can sacred Native land that has been intentionally defiled be made holy again? You know, I, I think it's, um, in some cases, yes.
for example, um, the Oneida uh, remediate, successfully re remediated some brownfields that had been returned to them from one of the papermaking um, companies in the area. And they um, they were able to um, do sparging and you know charcoal uh, filtered um, pump pump and treat operations there. But if you look at the Southwest, for example, um, there are some areas of Hopi shrines where people intentionally you know took guns and and blasted some of the um, the ancient symbols that the Hopi had placed there to mark their shrines. And those will never get, you know, I mean, th that that can never be restored. And those places are lost forever. You know, and it's not unlike, uh, you know, I, I actually got pretty, um, I don't know, just overwhelmed when I saw that um, the uh, ISIS blowing up that huge statue of Buddha. You know, that, that will, will never get that back. And even if you're not... Uh, um, a practicing Muslim, you know, as a human being, I can appreciate, you know, the the love and commitment that went into that site. And so, whether it's it's a you know a Buddha statue or whether it's um, a, a handprint on on a wall, a rock canyon wall, or whether it's um, a sacred site that someone is able to to remediate. I think, you know, we as human beings have to agree that, you know, just because the site is in our sacred site, we should have, you know, the 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 kindness and openness of heart to recognize and accommodate somebody else's sacred site. Ms. Lowe, thank you. John Bonds at Veal, I want to thank you for your presentation. Can you help us, for those of us who have not had a chance to be fully in communion with wilderness. Can you share the intellectual, emotional, and spiritual impact when you truly are in communion with your sacred wilderness sites? What What is that experience? Can you describe it? Well, first of all, I, I'm not sure that there is any true wilderness because human beings and animals and plants have left their mark on the landscape over tens of thousands of years. And so areas that, you know, that look to be wilderness actually may have been cleared, you know, deer brows and, and human beings have always been interacting with the landscape. But I'm, I'm not sure that it would be any different than the experience you might have. You know, when, when we're someplace and you feel connected to a forest or an ocean or something that's bigger than you and you begin to appreciate how everything connects to each other to to form this perfect place um i i don't think that's necessarily a native experience i think that's just a human experience and i bet everybody in this room has a sacred place that you know is sacred for some reason the question is when does a sacred when does a place become sacred enough to enough people so that the rest of us will agree that it's sacred and accommodate that sacredness uh thank you patty i <clears throat> hate to tell you you might want to add one more uh site on your slideshow the menominee nation mm -hmm. is uh staring at a, a metallic mine of the kind that we see back um, in the Crandon area. This one is in Michigan, so I think a lot of Wisconsinites don't know about it, but it's on the border river, the Menominee River. The, Mon the mouth of the Menominee is the um, uh, creation birthplace of the Menominee people in this area. And uh, the mine is well underway of being developed. It's not opened up yet, but big plans for another mine in Indian territory. So, yeah. yeah. And I know the Kiwana Bay Ojibwe um, are very concerned about that one, and that's the reservation that my mother was born on, Kiwana Bay. So, yeah, there are, um, and, and it's not just here in Wisconsin. Um, if you go to the southwest, it's, it's coal mining 
if you um, go to the plains, it's uranium mining, it's rock climbing on sacred places. I mean, there are different issues, the same song, second verse, and third verse, and fourth verse. But thank you, I think, for pointing that out. Uh, I had a question, uh, Frank Stein, uh, regarding political clout in the state. But here. Uh, I'm very impressed by the two victories, one of the sacred mounds and the other of the mine. And I do think that Native Americans have a lot to teach Americans about the environment and that their political clout is somehow underestimated. Now, you're a very small people compared to the majority, yet you were able to have two victories mm. against a uh, million dollar, all the multi million dollar mining corporation plus the uh, Republican Party in Wisconsin. How did you do? Well, you know, neither of those issues, I think all of us uh, are thinking that it's a temporary victory because Gogebeck still has the licenses, they still own the leases, they could come back at any time. Uh, we'd like to say, yeah, it was our treaty rights and you know, flex our political muscle that kept the, the mine from being built. But um, I think a lot of it had to do was the bottom dropped out of the taconite. Um, uh, price, I mean, prices just dropped into the basement you know, for taconite. And the effigy mounds, I mean, um, there are effigy mounds all over the state. And our burial laws, uh, are, the laws protecting them, are very, very weak. I mean, if you're a developer and there's an effigy mound in your way, you know, a lot of those, a lot of developers, um, I, I no, I don't want to say a lot of developers because I'd like to believe that that it's not a lot. But there are some developers who will say, oh, it's only 2500 bucks, so I'll just bulldoze it and pay the fine. It's part of the cost of doing business. So, you know, I, I think um, Native people have learned to be very vigilant, and we understand that um, that our natural resources and our lands um, are something that we constantly have to have to protect. And and you know the one thing there's a there's another prophecy in in um, the Ojibwe culture that says it it refers to um, time periods. And we're in the seventh fire right now, and and so each each fire is a different part of history. And in the seventh fire, the prophecy tells us that there's uh, this choice that happens. And a lot of environmental people have sort of interpreted it to mean this this um, choice either toward a sustainable future or um, a, a path that takes us toward consumption of, of our dwindling resources. But it says, the prophecy tells us that in this seventh fire, a new people will emerge. And they're not Ojibwe people. They are perhaps, I hope, people in this room that are going to recognize that the Native people that, that have lived close to this land and feel a, a stewardship toward it um, are acting in a way that benefits not just Native people, but everybody. You know, the water that we're trying to protect in Lake Superior is the water that your grandchildren and great grandchildren and great great grandchildren are going to be using, you know, 200 years in the future. And so we feel this, you know, this obligation, but we also feel this affinity. And so this, to me, as depressed as I get sometimes about some of the environmental um, activities that I see going on around me. This prophecy really makes me very optimistic because it's telling me that we're not alone, that there are non-Indian people that are going to take our hand and walk forward with us. One, I, I think I'm being told I have time for one more question. Hey, Dara. Hola. Hola, como estas? <laughs> so, Patty, um, Downtown Rotary is in a quest uh, to be more inclusive, to understand more about others that are not exactly like us. Can you tell us like, perhaps why we should come to the powwow in August? Uh, what, what else should we be doing to understand more our fellow brothers and sisters who are part of this, 
this nation here. We're so rich with Native Americans, and yet we don't know any. Ah, thank you. What, what a great, but I would say don't wait till August. There's one in April at the Alliance Center um, that Wang Sheik, the student operate, uh, the student organization puts on. It's April 1st and 2nd, right? Is that right? April 1st and 2nd? And um, and this is an event that's that's open to everyone. It's um, a really great way to enjoy some music, some songs, some dancing, vendors. Um, uh, what else? Um, food. Oh yes, there's a <laughs> my mother. You know, food. Tell them about the food. Yes. So uh, great place. If you've never had an Indian taco, good place to introduce yourself to it. But but you'll also see a lot of booths that have information about environmental issues and you know it's it's just a really it's a it's a the door opens and this is a great great door to open and a great room to enter and that could be the start of something really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.